Saki. The Interlopers. In a forest of mixed growth somewhere on the eastern spurs of the Carpathians, a man stood one winter night watching and listening, as though he waited for some beast of the woods to come within the range of his vision, and, later, of his rifle. But the game for whose presence he kept so keen an outlook was none that figured in the sportsman's calendar as lawful and proper for the chase. Ulrich von Gradwitz patrolled the dark forest in quest of a human enemy. The forest lands of Gradwitz were a wide extent and well stocked with game. The narrow strip of precipitous woodland that lay on its outskirt was not remarkable for the game it harbored or the shooting it afforded. It was the most jealously guarded of all of its owner's territories, however. A famous lawsuit in the days of his grandfather, it had wested from the illegal possession of a neighboring family of petty landowners. The dispossessed party had never acquiesced the judgment of the courts, and a long series of poaching affrays and similar scandals had embittered the relationships between the families for three generations. The neighbor feud had grown to a personal one since Ulrich had come to be head of his family. If there was a man in the world whom he detested and wished ill, it was Greg's name. The inheritor of the quarrel and the tireless game-snatching and raider of the disputed border forest. The feud might, perhaps, have died down or been composed, comp compromised if the personal ill will of the two men had not stood in the way. As boys, they had thirsted for one another's blood, as each man prayed that misfortune might fall on the other, and this wind-scourged winter night, Ulrich had banded together his foresters to watch the dark forest, not to quest for four-footed quarry, but to keep a lookout for the prowling thieves for whom he suspected of being a foot from across the land boundary. The roebuck, which usually kept the sheltered hollows during the storm wind, were running like a driven things tonight, and there were movement and unrest among the creatures that were wont to sleep through the dark hours. Assuredly, there was a disturbing element in the forest, and Ulrich could guess the quarter from whence it came. He strayed away by himself from the watchers whom he had placed in ambush on the crest of the hill, and wandered far down the steep slopes amid the wide tangle of undergrowth, peering through the tea trunks tree trunks, and listening through the whistling and skirling of the winds, and the resting, the restless beating of the branches for sight or sound of the marauders. If only on this wild night, in this dark, lone spot, he might come across Gorge's diamond, man to man, with none to witness. That was the wish that was uppermost in his thoughts. And as he stepped round the trunk, of a huge beach, he came face to face with the man he sought. The two enemies stood glaring at one another for a long, silent moment. Each had a rifle in his hand. Each had hate in his heart and murder uppermost in his mind. The chance had come to give full play to the passions of a lifetime. But a man who has not been brought up under the code of restraining civilization cannot easily nerve himself to shoot down his neighbor in cold blood and without word spoken, except for an offense given, his hearth and honor. And before the moment of hesitation had given away to action, a deed of nature's own violence overwhelmed them both. A fierce shriek of the storm had answered by a splitting crash over their heads and eerie they could leap aside a mass of falling beech tree had thundered down upon them. Ulrich von Gradwitz found himself stretched on the ground, one arm numbed beneath him, and the other held almost as haplessly in a tight tangle of forked branches, while both legs were pinned beneath the fallen mass. His heavy soot 
his heavy shooting boots had saved his feet from being crushed to pieces. But if his fractures were not as serious as they might have been, at least it was evident that he could not move from his present position till someone came to release him. The descending twigs that had slashed the skin of his face, and he had to wink away some drops of blood from his eyelashes before he could take a general view of the disaster. At his side, so near that under ordinary circumstances he could almost have touched him, lay Gorge Snyman, alive and struggling, but obviously as helpless, pinioned down himself. All round them lay the thick, strewn wreckage of splintered branches and broken twigs. Relief at being alive and exasperation at his captive plight brought a strange melody of pious thank offerings and sharp curses to Ulrich's lips. Gorge, who was nearly blinded with the blood which trickled across his eyes, stopped his struggling for a moment to listen, and then gave a, sh gave a short, snarling laugh. So you're not killed, as you ought to be, but you're caught anyway, he cried. Caught fast. Ho, oh, what a jest, Ulrich von Grodwitz, and sneered in his own stolen forest. There is real justice for you. And he laughed again, mockingly and savagely. I'm caught in my own forest land, reported Ulrich. When my men come to release us, you will wish, perhaps, that you are in a better plight than caught poaching on a neighbor's land. Shame on you. Gorge was silent for a moment, and then he answered quietly. Are you sure that your men will come and find much to release? I have men, too, in the forest tonight, close behind me, and they will be here first and do the releasing. When they drag me out from under these damned branches, it won't need much clumsiness on their part to roll this massive tree trunk right over the top of you. Your men will find you dead under a fallen tr beech tree. From form's sake, I shall send my condolences to your family. It is a useful hint, said Ulrich fearlessly. My men had orders to follow in ten minutes' time, seven of which must have gone by already. And when they get me out, I will remember the hint. Not only as you will have met your death poaching on my lands, I don't think I can decently send any message of condolences to your family. Good, snarled Gorge. Good. We fight this quarrel out to the death, you and I and our foresters, with no cursed interlopers to come between us. Death and damnation to you, Ulrich von Grodwitz. And same to you, Gorge Zneiman, forest thief, game snatcher. Both men spoke with the bitterness of possible defeat before them, <clears throat> for each knew that it might be long before his men would seek out to find him. It would be a bare matter of chance which party would arrive first at the scene. Both had now given up the useless struggle to free themselves from the mass of wood that held them down. Ulrich limited his endeavors to an effort to bring one of his partially free arms near enough to his outer coat pocket to draw out his wine flask. Even when he had accomplished that operation, it was long before he could manage the unscrewing of the stopper or get any of the liquid down his throat. But when a heaven-sent drought it seemed, it was an open winter, and a little snow had fallen yet. Hence the captives suffered less from the cold than might have been the case at the season of the at that season of the year. Nevertheless, the wine was warming and reviving to the wounded man, and he looked across with something like a throb of pity to where his enemy lay, just keeping the groans of pain and weariness from crossing his lips. "'Could you reach the flask if I threw it over to you?' asked Ulrich suddenly. "'There is good wine in it, and one may well be as comfortable as one can. "'Let us drink,' even if tonight one of us dies. No, I can scarcely see anything. There is so much blood caked around my eyes, said Gorge. And in any case, I don't drink wine with an enemy. Ulrich was silent for, for a minute and lay listening to the weary screeching of the wind. An idea was slowly forming and growing in his brain, an idea that gained strength every time that he looked across 
to, at the man who was fighting so grimly against pain and exhaustion. In the pain and languor that Ulrich himself was feeling, the old fierce hatred seemed to be dying down. Neighbor, he said presently, do as you please if your men come first. It was a fair compact. As for me, I've changed my mind. If my men are to come first, you shall be the first to be helped, as though you were my guest. We have quarreled like devils our, all our lives over this stupid strip of forest, where the trees can't even stand upright in the breath of the wind. Laying here tonight, thinking, I've come to think we've been rather fools. There are better things in life than getting the better of boundary disputes. Neighbor, if you will help me to bury the old quarrel, I, I will ask you to be my friend. Gorge Zneiman was so silent for so long that Ulrich thought perhaps he had fainted with the pain of his injuries. Then he spoke slowly and in jerks. How the whole region would stare and gabble if we rose into the market square together. No one living can remember seeing a Zneiman and a von Gradwitz talking to another in friendship. What a peace there would be among the forester folk if we ended our feud tonight. If we chose to make peace among our people, there is none other to interfere, no interlopers from outside. You would come and keep the Sylvester night beneath our roof, and I would come and feast on some high day at your castle. I would never fire a shot at your land, save when you invited me as a guest. And you should come and shoot with me down in the marshes where the wild fowl are. In all the countryside, there are none that should hinder if we willed to make peace. I never thought it to have wanted to do other than to hate you with all of my life. But I think that I have changed my mind about things too, this last half hour. And you offered me your wine flask. Ulrich von Gradwitz, I will be your friend. For, the, for a space, both men were silent, turning over their minds the wonderful changes that this dramatic reconciliation would bring about. In the cold, gloomy forest, with the wind tearing in the fitful gusts through the naked branches and whistling round the tree trunks, they lay and waited for the help that would now bring release and succor to their parties. And each prayed a private prayer that his men might be the first to arrive so that he might be the first to show honorable attention to the enemy that had become his friend. Presently, as the wind dropped for a moment, Ulrich broke the silence. Let's shout for help, he said. In this lull, I'll, our voices may carry a, a little way. They won't carry far, though, the trees and undergrowth, said Gorge. But we can try, together then. The two raised their voices in a prolonged hunting call, together again said Ulrich a few minutes later after listening in vain for an answering hallow. I heard something that time, I think, said Gorick. I heard nothing but the pestilential wind, said Gorge hoarsely. There was a silence again for some minutes, and then Ulrich gave a joyful cry. I can see figures coming through the woods. They are following in a way I, I came down the hillside. Both men raised their voices in a lap in as loud a shout as they could muster. They'll hear us. They've stopped. Now they see us. They're running down the hill towards us, cried Ulrich. How many of you see there, asked Gorge. I can't see distinctly, said Ulrich. Nine or ten. Then they are yours, said, Gorge. said Gorge. I only had seven out with me. They are making all the speed they can, brave lads, said Ulrich gladly. Are they your men? asked Gorge. Are they your men? He repeated impatiently as Ulrich did not answer. No, Ulrich said with a laugh, the idiotic chattering laugh of a man unstrung with hideous fear. Who are they? asked Korge quietly, straining his eyes to see what others would gladly have not seen. Wolves. Wolves. That's a short story by Saki. Uh... If I'm not mistaken, was an Englishman in the 20, uh, 19th century who converted to Sufi Islam. 
and what a bunch of books. I think that story is similar to a lot of real life struggles, historical and personal. Um, the Hatfields and the McCoys is the classic example that happened in American history. But what I think beyond that, that it really is, <clears throat> is a distillate of what a story really is. He introduced the characters, he introduced a problem, they had an obstacle, they overcame the obstacle, then there was a twist, and it wound down. And the, the twist wind down sort of happens in a few words, but... Uh, that's it. I think what Saki did was show that you can tell a story really simply. It's four pages. It took me 15 minutes to read it out loud. Um, you can tell it really succinctly. I don't know how many words it is, but I would guess it's 2,000 words at the most. It's very short. And that is all you need to tell a story. So it can even be shorter than that. So, if you were to just summarize it, you could say somewhere in Germany, a guy takes some land from his neighbor using the court system, and a few generations later, everyone's still pissed, and one night, the two guys are both hunting in the same stolen or the same you know the same disputed piece of land and they hate each other and they see each other and they're going to shoot each other but then lightning strikes and a branch falls on them and then they argue and because they have men with them that night they're like oh you know one person's going to get found first and we're going to kill the other guy but then they decide not to they just sort of bury the hatchet and then they think they see someone's coming, and instead of it, one of their guys, it's a wolf. So now you can see that you can tell that 15-minute story in one minute, maybe two minute and a half, something like that. So all you have to do is identify these key parts of a story, and then you can blow it up. And then you can take a one-minute story, and you can turn it into 15 minutes. You can take a 15-minute story and turn it into 90 minutes, or so on and so forth. Take an hour story and turn it into eight hours. And just the level of detail that you have that goes into the backstories and how much more you want to tell, right? There should have been, could have been three generations, you know, right? So we had that 15-minute story. You know nothing about the middle generation, right? So there's there's multiple stories you could have told there. It depends on how big you want to make it. So someone could turn this little story, which I could summarize in a minute, maybe less, uh, into a multi-part movie trilogy, so it really depends, when you're writing a story, you follow a specific theme. Uh, you know, this is basic character arc, uh, three-act structure sort of deal. Uh, the character arc, you know, friends become enemies, enemies become friends. There's a twist at the end, so on and so forth. Um, or you find some other motif that you want to follow, like maybe a utopian story, where you just tell about how... We get to some utopia and then everything ends perfectly. Or you tell a dystopian story and you tell, you explain how everything goes to shit and at the end of the story everything really goes to shit because of the human nature and the way that we set up our society or something. Or maybe it's a love story. <laughs> you know, and you just follow, you figure out what, you, what story you want to tell and then you insert the details. This one was two people arguing about uh, some land. So... Find a way, a motif, to tell your story. And then insert what you know, what they say. Write what you know. Unless you're Herman Melville. And then don't talk about whaling so much. We don't need to know about knots for a thousand pages. Don't write Moby Dick. I don't know how that guy got away with that. So anyway, that's my thoughts on how to construct a story, how to turn a short story into a longer story, or how to turn a very, very, very short story into a, you know, a few thousand words. See you soon, guys.